Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen ben Danun with Danun Institute of Biblical Research. And today's message is a little interesting. It's actually, I'm not sure if I'm going to title it this way yet on YouTube, but the thought that came to my mind is the that woman, Jezebel. I'm going to be going into some different areas here, <clears throat> but I, I really wanted to expose who Jezebel really is. Jezebel is a very common woman used biblically to also bash women as well. Uh, in fact, I got a, a letter just recently uh, <clears throat> said that, you know, Steve, you're just uh, ruled by your wife uh, and she has a Jezebel spirit upon her. Well, I'm just always wonder what would they say about the other great women of the Bible then? What would they say about the women that Jesus admired in his day or, 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 or maybe shouldn't say admired, but lifted them up? Uh, what would they say about the woman at the well that ran and told all the people in her city, totally contrary to what she should do of that day, according to the doctrines that were going around uh, of that day, telling all the people in the city, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. What would they say about when the apostles abraded? Uh, Mary, or excuse me, uh, Mary comes and tells about the resurrection of uh, Yeshua and uh, being Jesus and the people there uh, the, the apostles did not believe her. Jesus abraded them for their unbelief. Uh, what would they say about who the, the prophet when the Levites actually go and consult her to find out the mind of God? What would they think about Deborah that God appointed to be a judge over Israel, led Israel in her battles 40 years? Uh, we could just go on and on and on and on. There were many other women that were mentioned as apostles, but it comes back to the same old thing, and that is in 325, uh, A.D., or, or the C.E. Common Era, whichever you want to call it, uh, we find that the church and state unite. Constantine has uh, uh, convenes a meeting called the um, Nicaea Council and brings together the, the clergy of that day there of what would be considered Christianity uh, and decides to make church and state united after he has a dream about a cross uh, goes into battle, wins a battle, and uh, he wants to make church and state united as one. And uh, at that point, there's a lot of different canons of scripture that are out there. Uh, I shouldn't say canons. There's a lot of different letters that are out there. The Hebrew Bible was already canonized by the Jewish believers. And uh, so the, the, the birth of the Catholic Church through Constantine, Church and State Uniting, they decide which letters are of the apostles that came after uh, Jesus, after his death there, would actually be canonized in the scripture. Many of these things we never get to see. We never get to see the letters that are sent to Paul, his answering of those letters. We never get to see all the different writings of Thomas and and uh, Philip and, uh, you know, did, did Bartholomew write letters? Did, uh, uh, did other, the other apostles write as well? We get just a very few select hand of letters there. Even other letters they say that Peter wrote um, that are not mentioned whatsoever. Because why? In 325, the Constantine and the church leaders at that time determined what would be canonized as scripture. And uh, so... There's a lot of people that are very protective. Of course, you know, like I said, the Catholic Church, they put the book of Maccabees in. Uh, the Jewish rabbis, the only reason they did not canonize the book of Maccabees is because the Hanukkah story of lights, which was the most important part, was left out. Not that it wasn't a great victory uh, that is actually recording it of the Maccabee brothers, but also because those brothers end up becoming the kings of Israel afterwards, and the monarchy only lasted 100 years, and of course the temple was destroyed, so therefore the Jews were concerned uh, that that book not be canonized as part of scripture. Uh, but nonetheless, as I've said, there were many other books that were burned, destroyed, because the Catholic Church didn't want anybody knowing about them. Now, I can't say now, 2,000 years later, what the authenticity of those books are or anything of that nature there. But what I can do, though, is what we do have for, for canonized scripture there, uh, we can look at the inspired writings that we do have. And we can see exactly that there was an agenda. 
Now, it's not just scholars of today. I'm going to take you because I'm also, I'm very seriously dealing with the issue of women. And it's something that has really not been comfortable for a lot of men. And I can tell you why. I know why. I clearly pointed it out not long ago. It's a matter of lust. It's a matter of things that people have not overcome. Now, some men might say that you know, women are just out there. They, 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 they entice men. They, they tease them. They do this. They do that and everything. You have to remember, men, men are the ones that have taken and made women sex symbols and sex slaves to begin with. It's the lust of men that has caused a lot of the problems that we have today. But there's a lot of godly women out there. And just because they don't want to go by your standard doesn't make them bad women. And we're going to deal with some of those issues here. I'm going to show you the agenda. And I ask you, though, those of you that are very faithful to the King James Version Bible, and I do appreciate a lot of the work that was placed into this, this as well, and how that there was the, the revolt against the Catholic Church. But unfortunately, they've all gone, they're going right back to their mother prostitute church as we see recorded in the book of Revelation. We're going to get into that tonight as well as we look at the spirit of Jezebel as she's moved down and who God considers Jezebel to be. So if you have your Bible, turn with me. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12. This is where we're going to begin. Now I'm going to read to you from the King James Version Bible here <clears throat> to start it off. And like I said, it's no slant on the people that adore the King James Version. I do appreciate the King James Version myself, but I also realize that translators are not inspired of God, though they may do the best they can. Many translators during the past were under agenda, but I should say more since the time of Constantine on forward anyway from that, from that era for sure. Uh, but anyway, it says here, as for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. It's Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12. Most of the time when people <clears throat> write me, they like to tell me, they say, well, you didn't read the rest of the part of there and, it, and it's not in context with what you just said there. If you were to read the next couple of verses, whether you go forward or backward in this, you would find out that the way this is translated absolutely makes no sense with the context of the page error. But I'm not a big fan on that because I realize God can put something in there that seems kind of awkward, but yet it's prophetic. And most preachers, especially those that do not like women, love this particular verse here, and they look at it as being prophetic, not as so much as something of the time during the time of Isaiah the prophet, but they look at it as a prophetic scripture. So it says, for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. They say, that's something that's happening in our day that we live in now. Well, the problem is, is it translated correctly? Well, this is the language that I can understand. So therefore, I get to have my own say in this, but I'm not just going to use my say. I'm going to take you through a little bit of scholastic depth with it as well so that you can see it's just not Brother Steve. It's deeper than that. And I'm going to take you beyond your King James version as well. And I'm not picking on King James. You have to understand, I'm trying to get you to understand, look beyond the bounds of translators because nowhere does the scripture say that translators were inspired of God and moved by the Holy Spirit. No, sir. It says that the prophets of old were moved by God and by the Holy Spirit, not translators. Okay? Translators, honest men trying to do the best they can. But in some instances... They may be coerced. And I'm afraid that's what happened in this case as well. Let's see what happened right here. In the scripture here, Ami Nagaav, Moelel, Ve Nashim, Mashalu Bo. That is the sentence in the Hebrew language. Now, at first glance, if you just glance at it, for someone that speaks Hebrew, something doesn't make sense at all. Even in the Mamre translation, which is in modern times, the Mamre translation, by the way, that kind of interesting in itself. I'll go into it a little bit later. But when they translate it in English, they put on there, as for my people, of course, the word as for really is not there. It just says, ami, my people, is literally what it says. We don't have the as for in there at all. That's okay. I can understand why you put as for, just like you do in the King James. As for my people, a babe is their master, and women rule over them. Still, they keep the same context. 
But here's where the problem come in, comes in. Molalal, molalal. Nowhere in scripture except here do they translate this word as babe. Nowhere. I mean, it is, it's just not correct. Yelid is a child in Hebrew. Yeladim, plural, children. You might say b'nei. It literally means sons, but we say b'nei Yisrael, the children of Israel. But nowhere would we call a child molalel. It doesn't make sense. It's totally not correct, not even in the root of the word. Anywhere you look at it, it has nothing to do with children. In fact, in other parts of the scripture, and I wrote down two just for your own reference here, Leviticus 19.10 and also Deuteronomy 24.21, it is to glean or to abuse. To glean, gleaning in this case here is taking though, but something that you're not taking, you're not doing, you're, you're taking it uh, abusively is what it is. It has nothing to do with kindness in this case here. It is abusive and definitely nothing to do, with, to do with children. But where did the problem come in? The problem comes in from a word that is there, nashim. Well, nashim is actually a homonym. Yes, it does mean women. And if you take it from the vowelization that we have in the Hebrew today, it would mean woman. It's exactly right. But it goes deeper than that. You have to remember the Hebrew Bible, even like, for example, the Dead Sea Scrolls, we don't have vowels in there. Don't have vowels at all. Vowels were never brought into the Hebrew uh, Bible until the 11th century. From about the 6th century to the 11th century, there were several different families that began to work on vowelization. Why? Because about 200 years after the destruction of the third temple, excuse, yeah, second temple, excuse me, second temple was, was destroyed, the Hebrew language, because the people being scattered, began to die down. And the people were not knowing their own language any longer. And so 400 years later, after that particular point, the rabbis that do know the Hebrew said, we've got to do something or the people are going to lose the ability to be able to speak this language. So they began to vowelize the Bible. Well, <clears throat> in the families that actually did this, one of the families um, was Ben Asher. Another one is uh, Ben Naftali. Well, Ben Asher, out of the, these were the two main ones that did these translations. Ben Asher was from... Uh, Northern Africa, over uh, in Egypt, uh, very well-known uh, scholar, uh, very renowned, very well accepted in his community, in the Jewish community there. That's part of why we come from some of our, uh, from some of our philosophy. He was a philosopher. Some of the teachings in, in Judaic literature comes from him. And, uh, but even though he actually was selected for the vowelization that he did, um, ben Naftali, who was from the uh, from Iran, from from the from the Babylonian Empire, there, his were knocked down. But in this case here, it was Ben Asher's idea of what belonged there that got put in in its stead, in its place. But the thing is, is even there was there was a notable rabbi during this time that did not agree with him whatsoever. Um, but anyway, before I get into that, one of the things that I wanted to show to you, though, is, um, well, let me, let me, let me just do like, cause I, I really, I don't want to get too far from this. I need, I want to take you and I, I want you to understand what it was like for women during the Byzantine time, because that's what they called that during the 11th century time frame is called the Byzantine time. And I think it had a lot to do with the influence of the translation, especially from the Asher family there, because women were very much looked down upon, uh, majorly so, in fact. Uh, and I, I pulled up a book by Michael Angold. It's called Church and Society in the Byzantine under, under Khomeini. And this is something that is written in his book there, and I want to read a little excerpt for you. I think it's page 469 on this here. I'm, I, I, forgive me, I may not have got the page number right. 
I forgot to note that. He said the status of the Byzantine women was no better than it was in many other patriarchal society. They were expected to be dependents, first on their fathers, then on their husbands. Marriage was their natural state and the family and household their setting. Among the aristocracy, they were segregated in the women's quarters where they were tended by eunuchs, they wore veils, were kept in seclusion, and were denied access to public life, and more often than not, to education. In most respects, the law discriminated against women. There were also usual prejudice nurtured by Christianity. No surprise there, is it? They were the daughters of Eve. They sexually, excuse me, their sexuality was dangerous and constant temptation. It was to be channeled or controlled through marriage or the veil. By the way, the veil being the black veil of the Catholic Church that a nun takes, that she sells out. And of course, anyone that knows anything about the nunnery, if you take the, uh, the black veil, you actually go into seclusion where you are beaten as a woman for the rest of your life and tortured. That you, All you have to do is look up uh, behind the black veil, uh, any of these type things there of the Catholic order, and you will find out the debauchery that has actually happened, that is, that is uh, documented that the Catholic Church does to these nuns, uh, not to mention all the perversion with the altar boys that we see on the news, but that's nothing in comparison to what these nuns, these young women, these young virgins that are taken and done to. Now, this also has a lot of the influence of the early church, so-called church fathers, where I've mentioned to you before, they were bigoted towards women, they were bigoted towards Jews, they hated the Jews, they hated women. Uh, every one of them, including Martin Luther, uh, you can go to, 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 to well, I, I quoted some of those in a video earlier, so I don't have those quotes before me there, but it is appalling to see the way they thought of women during this time frame. So uh, at, any, at any rate, um, uh, this, that's exactly what she would become. She became a nun. So let's go back to the scripture here, though. So I, I set this stage for you like that. And the reason I did is because the vowelization was placed in the Hebrew Bible during a time, especially during a time that both on the Judaic side, both in the Arabic world, because uh, the Muslim religion had gained a foothold since the Catholic Church had started that by the time of the vowelization. And, uh, and Ben Asher actually puts the Kamat under the noon when it doesn't make any sense. So therefore, they, have to, they got a problem. How do you translate this? Uh, if you don't put the word women there, you're going to have to change another word as well and come up and make up a word and call it a child or a babe or whatever you want to call it in order to make it look good because it doesn't fit the context of what's being spoken here. So they did that. They changed that. And it was easy for them to do because they were looking for something to keep women suppressed even at that early of a stage. Now, you say, Brother Steve, that sounds a little bit far-fetched. You're just saying these things. Uh, you know, okay, we might can agree with you with uh, Molalel, but Nashim, we know that that means women. We can see that in our dictionary. But as I said to you, it is a homonym, and it means women or exactor. So, but let's prove then, what did Jewish scholars believe before Ben Asher, before Ben Naftali? And I don't know what Ben Naftali did. He may have actually got it right. Uh, there is a rabbi that was very su supportive of his vowelization over Ben Asher. So I'd really be curious to know if Ben Naftali actually got this one right or not. But during the time of the Septuagint, 200 years before Yeshua comes on the scene, two to 300 years roughly in that time frame there, uh, there were, the Septuagint was... Uh, the, the Hebrew scripture was translated into Greek because there were a lot of the Jews that had became and other societies uh, scattered around the, uh, the earth at that time. And they wanted them to know their Bible as well. So they translated it into the Greek language. It was Hebrew scholars, 70 to 72 it was estimated, that were a part of this. And they translated Isaiah 3, chapter, chapter 3, verse 12, totally different than what we have today. They should know more about what Moses had to say because, by the way, by the time that they put the vowelization in, 1,400 years had already passed. But 1,400 years earlier, this is the way they wrote it. And I'm going to read it and continue right down the way it should be 
written, As for my people, tax gatherers glean them, and exactors rule over them. O my people, they that lead thee cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy paths. The Lord standeth up to plead, and standeth to judge the peoples. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of his people, and the princes thereof. It is ye that have eaten up the vineyard, the spoil of the poor is in your houses. Now... It makes sense, doesn't it? Because you know what? If God is going to stand up and he's going to do the pleading, and if it's children and women that are the problem, he would have named the children and the women, but he doesn't do that. He names the elders of his people and the princes thereof. And the elders are the ones doing the cleaning. And the exactors are the princes that are ruling over them. And those that are ruling over them He said, see, and all my people, they that lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. And it was true. It was always the princes and the elders of Israel. They were constantly leading the children of Israel off the path of righteousness. Now, that's exactly the way it was. And so King James didn't get it right there. And according to the Hebrew Hebraic scholars of the Septuagint, 1400 years before the King James, well, the King James Version was written probably another four or five hundred years later. So uh, I forget exactly. I'm so sorry. I don't. I don't know, remember when this King James was written there at this particular. Now there's the what? Oh goodness, can't remember. Now, 14th century, something like that. But anyhow, um, even that didn't work out either. So, uh, so it's it's nothing against the translators there. We don't know what kind of duress they were under. And, and maybe in the case of the King James, they were just getting something passed on maybe from Jewish people where the Jews had changed it to try to keep women suppressed. But as I said, what are you going to do with all the women that God has chosen? What are you going to do with, with uh, Phoebe? What are you going to do with Priscilla? What are you going to do with Mary Magdalene? What are you going to do with, with, the, with the different secular writings that were out there that had no political motive. They just write about the events of the day that Jesus lived in. They write about Jesus. They write about Paul. And they talk about they were the most liberal to women of their time. Now, I'm not for feminism where, you know, you have a right to go abort children and stuff like that. That's not what I'm talking about. But I am a right for equality where God has made men and women equal to serve in him. I'm talking about where the scripture says there's neither male nor female in Christ Jesus. And until, my brethren, you get to a place where you quit looking at gender, you will not overcome the lust of the flesh. I can tell you that right now. Because the only way you're going to overcome, not just turn your head, no, sir, that has nothing to do with it. There is a way to get a place in Christ to where you get so deep and so in love with him that your sister is your sister. She is a part of the body of Christ. And when she is a part of the body of Christ, she's part of his body. So when you begin to slam her and put her down, you're putting Christ down. And that puts you in a very bad light because he doesn't look at her with a gender. Now, he made us different. That's true. It's just like some people might say to me, they say, well, Brother Steve, you know, God, he picked 12 apostles and they were all men. Mm -hmm. They were all Jews, too. So do you have a right to preach the gospel in that case? No, see. Why? What happened? The gospel was open to the Gentiles after what? After the resurrection of Christ. It was also open to women apostles at that time as well. Priscilla, it's actually been attributed by scholars that wrote the book of Hebrews. It's nothing like Paul's writings. Not one single bit. All right. Now, I kind of got on a tooth there, but I'm try- I need to stay on track here. I want to take you into that woman Jezebel because this is the serious problem we have. I got a letter, uh, or maybe as a, uh, actually a comment on YouTube there, and um, uh, quite a few times I've seen this comment here. It was being quoted from um, 1 Timothy. They said, okay. You might say that kephale means head out of uh, the book of Ephesians, and you might even say that the women keep in silent in the churches. Uh, You might try to explain that away for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, but you know what? What are you going to do then with 1 Timothy? Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not woman to teach nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Well, people love to quote Paul. Poor Paul, I feel sorry for the guy. He probably has a... I don't know if he laughs mourns or what he does at some of the foolishness of today. 
But anyway. Oh, gosh, let's let's begin in verse 7. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and ver- ver- verity. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel and with excuse me, shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, charity, and uh, holiness with sobriety. Sobriety. Now, (laughs) <laughs> that's a mouthful right there, boy. You know, now you have to understand in the King James Bible here, the King James Version here, uh, there's a lot of issues right here. A lot of issues. You know, I, I, myself, I like to take you back to the original Greek and, and, and to get you to understanding certain words, what they mean and how they translate. Uh, let's first deal with uh, uh, the, the whole situation, that we're, oh gosh, so I got to figure out where to even be. Let's go, we'll take it verse by verse. Verse 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shame, faith, sobriety, not with broided hair uh, or gold or pearls or costly array. Let's look at what was happening in Ephesus. Go back to chapter 1. As I besought thee, verse, chapter 1, verse 3, to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies with which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith so do. Paul already knows there's a problem. Genealogies is one of them. Now I'm going to, bear with me, I got to take you to that genealogy in a little bit. I'm going to show you where Paul is dealing with it in chapter 2 here, but I'm going to take you back further. You need to understand why this is a genealogy issue. Now, what's actually going on is in Ephesus, they have the goddess uh, Artemis is one way to look at it, or Diana. We find this also in in, in the book of Acts, where Paul is dealing with that. I think it's Acts chapter 19. And the people for like two hours kept screaming out, great is the goddess Diana, great is the goddess Diana. Why? Because Paul ran into the the, the silversmith that made all the little gods and their livelihood was being made by making these images of the goddess Diana uh, or Artemis in this case here. And it became a major problem. The gospel of Jesus Christ was causing the, 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 the economics to go down. And that silversmith got with other people that were making these gods and said, look, this man is ruining our economy with this doctrine of Christ because nobody's going to buy the, 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 the things if they keep it up. So they came in against Paul for two hours and pounded on him like that. Now, all right, this is going to get good, guys. It's really going to get good. So let's start to look at this. What is this goddess uh, uh, Diana or Artemis? What is she? She is a fertility god. And it's got its roots way back, way back. I'm going to take you into that in a minute. The the roots of this goes way back into the history of Israel. And in a few minutes, you'll see why the the people actually even accepted this in the first place. But uh, so at at any rate, they believe that... uh, through the goddess Diana, <clears throat> it, is, it is a goddess that goes back into genealogy of matriarchs. And their doctrine believed that women were the enlightened ones. And that Adam was the one that was in the transgression, which the Bible does say that as well. But it doesn't put Eve in any bad light whatsoever. In other words, Eve never did nothing wrong. That's the way the gospel, that's the way the doctrine does. And she is the birther of the child. And so therefore, they would have men that the only way that their wives would be safe in having their children, they were to come to sacrifice to the goddess Diana or Artemis, and they were to come to wild sexual orgy 
uh, uh, parties there, or probably wasn't party, but it was always a violent type of sexual behavior that their husbands had to do with these, these, uh, these women that were kept as sex slaves inside of this temple, uh, this Artemis temple. And they said that if they did this, then their wives would be safe in bearing their children, that they would not lose their children to death. Uh, and I'm going to show you where that comes in at. You're going to be very surprised to find out where they're tracing this roots back because they trace it back to Eve. Okay, they are using biblical characters in their tracing of the roots. So, and by the way, I'll just kind of give you a little bit of a hint there. They use Rachel because Rachel was considered one of the matriarchs and they use her in this. We find this in, in, in the Jewish side of this, um, <clears throat> which I'll go into in a few minutes here with you. Um, and in the goddess Ash, Ashtaroth, uh, this is where they were using um, uh, they, they were using Rachel as a matriarch as one of their gods that they used to serve. And and so just like with Daniel, they made an image that everybody had to bow down in the time of uh, Daniel's time. And there's some scholars that believe that the image was actually made of Daniel. So good godly people get caught up in the crossfire of this. So anyway, they had these wild sex orgies there in order to save, to keep the women safe in their childbearing. So here's where we get this, the, the troubles that get, that get brought in. Now, verse 9, it deals with it like this here. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Well, if you got a sex orgy type of environment there, no doubt the women were looking very risque and they were trying to win converts to Christ, but they still no doubt were, were still dressing according to this custom with shamefacedness. Now, that's just an old-fashioned way of the, um, of, 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 from Old English translation in the King James Version. There are other versions that translate that a little bit differently. Uh, it would be more in uh, a bashful look. Uh, but that bashfulness is towards men. In other words, don't be on, coming on to men, uh, you know, because, you know, it's, it's, it's made to attract men that, have, that are not even their wives, you see. So they're saying, don't do that. Uh, but to be more uh, sober and, and not with broided hair or golds or pearls or costly array because this was part of the enticement of this particular uh, religion in Ephesus there. But he said, but that which becometh a woman professing godliness with good works, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Wow. Now we start getting into the interesting stuff there. But I suffer not a woman to, to teach nor to assert authority over the man, but be in silence. Mm. Okay. Now, Paul is actually dealing with a specific woman. And the reason we know this is because of several things. It actually does not say in Greek, but I suffer not a woman to teach. It says, I suffer not that woman to teach, nor, and the word usurp is, is a very unusual word in Greek. It's authenteo. And, a, and that, is with, that is a woman that has come in with a violent behavior. She is violent and usurping the authority of, over the men. In other words, they're trying to teach and she's coming in there just like they did. We see in Acts 19 where they're all screaming and shouting, great is the God of Diana. You know, they're, they're going like crazy over there. Well, this is the same thing they're doing there because these women that were part of these uh, temples were taught with violent sexual contact and sexual order. And so therefore, Paul is trying to teach the women that are coming out and recognizing Christ don't be like that. Don't have that violent nature, see? And uh, so then he goes in also to the other problem that, that he has there. Um, and he, he's telling her to be silent is what he's doing. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Remember, because their doctrine believed that women were the enlightened ones. They flip-flopped it is what they did. They did just the opposite of what men are trying to do with the Bible today, trying to make it look like women are nobody and the men was a great one when even the scripture plainly says God put the blame on Adam. But he's dealing with this. That's why he goes over here. He says, neither heed to fables and endless genealogies. All right, now, I take you there, but I want to take you back. And I need you to understand some things that will really help you. Um, and this all begins actually with Jezebel. Believe it or not, that may be a hard thing for you to take, but this is where it comes from. 
That woman Jezebel, who really is Jezebel? Now, some people believe that Jezebel, uh, I've actually heard ministers uh, that have quoted and said that she's the only woman that wore makeup in the Bible. And that's not true. Uh, God says to Israel, though you paint your face in vain, will you do it? Uh, so the children of Israel, the women there were painting their faces as well. So we know that that is not necessarily true there. She did paint her face to go out to meet Jehu. And uh, God, you know, that's, of course, her judgment was at that time. But Ahab also got judgment and uh, so didn't make him any better. But what was the problem here? Let's actually, let me find, I have the scriptures laid out on these things here. I want to bring you into where Jezebel comes in on the scene here. And it's in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 19. It says, Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel. Um, wait a minute. I'm sorry. That's not the scripture I wanted to bring to you here. i got to figure out where I put it at here. Um... Okay, 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 31. My apology there. Now, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zedodians, and went and served Baal, and worshipped him. So immediately we find out that Ahab, he's already a wicked and evil man to start with. It didn't do him any favors at all. He's the king of Israel. He's done all kinds of evil, just like um, his father Omri did. Uh, but And God says if it wasn't a light thing for him to do that, he goes and marries Jezebel. Now Jezebel... The Bible says that, that, uh, that she is the daughter of Ithbael, who is the king of the Zidonians. And then Ahab goes and serves Baal as God as well. But the question is, if she's from the Z uh, Zidonians, who are the Zidonians? The Zidonians, by the way, are the ones that actually worship Ashtaroth, the goddess of fertility. This is what Paul deals with in 1 Timothy chapter 2. But it actually first gets introduced into the Jewish society, Jewish community there. And to, I have one authority that I use on this is, the, is from the Jewish court, quarterly. It's called Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians. And in here, they document the birth of this goddess and trace the origins back to the worship of Rachel. Unfortunately, our godly sister, Rachel, gets caught up into this. Uh, it, they say in here that, uh, that they worship the host of heaven. Ashtaroth was considered Venus uh, and was, uh, of course, it was the moon god that gave birth to her um, and, was a crucial, and she was crucial for fertility. They also believed in genealogy, both of animal and humankind. It's another very interesting thing in the way that they served their gods at that particular time there. Genealogy was a major issue, and what they were looking for was the matriarchs through the children of Israel. And it goes all the way back to Eve, but Rachel was a very important one for them. Why? Because she actually dies during childbirth. Now, move back forward in the time with 1 Timothy there. See, Rachel died in childbirth. Here, here the Zidonians, they're bringing in their, their religion of Ashtoreth, and Balaam, and by the way, there's a lot of uh, scholastic research that actually looks at Balaam and Ashtaroth as being the gods and the goddesses, actually being a, a more accurate translation for that. And I can understand that, but they, they literally believe that if you worship these gods, that you would be safe in your childbearing, that it was important for conception, it was fertility, all these things here was to do this. And this was during the time Jezebel brings those particular 
religions into Israel. But here's what's odd, though. Why would the Jewish people actually fall for these type of gods? Well, you got to remember, if you go all the way back from the time of Abraham and Nahor, his father and, and his, his uh, brother-in-law and them, they were serving other gods at one time anyway. But what have they done? Much like the Catholic Church has done today, they take godly people and make them gods and make images unto them like the Catholic Church has done to Mary, who was the mother of Jesus, a blessed, honorable woman that all generations should remember, as God says, as, excuse me, as Christ actually writes about in his own writings. But we're not to make her a god. Neither, no more should have Rachel been made a god. Now, going back to Timothy, when they talk about, you know, not to sup, uh, serve authority over the man, but to be in silence, we, we address that. It's not, it's, it, she was coming in violently and, and trying to force her doctrine in on there. But what was that verse 15? I forgot to bring that back out to you. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. No, the Greek word there is she shall be safe in childbearing. Paul was trying to deal with this issue. They were bringing the doctrine of Diana, which was Artemis, which was Ashtaroth in the Hebrew language. They were bringing this goddess of fertility in there that the men were to go to these wild sexual parties in order to keep their wife safe in childbearing. And they were using a god and they took it all the way back to the time of Jezebel, the Zidonians, who actually took Rachel as one of those and made a goddess of Rachel because she died in giving childbirth. And they're using that, and the people in Ephesus are falling for it because it's a biblical name from the Jewish people that this, and, and I can't say that that was, you know, we know that the God that they had there, Diana, was not Rachel. We know that. But the roots of this come back from there. That's what I'm trying to show you, the roots of it. Not that they were bowing down to a, 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 a statue of Rachel. We know it was one of the seven wonders of the world back in that time period there, the, the goddess of Diana. It's a horrible, ugly figure there of a woman with just, just numerous breasts all around her. But in this case here, the early roots of the Zidonians were doing the exact same thing. And they were doing it for the safety of childbearing and fertility because Rachel died in childbearing. All right. So Paul is dealing with this issue. In the 15th verse, he says that you will be safe in childbearing. In other words, shut that lady up, or not that lady, that woman that came in here, shut her up. She's trying to bring this doctrine in. She's bringing in this false genealogy. What were the Zidonians doing? They were also using the genealogy, taking it all the way back to the Eve. And Eve was the main matriarch. And even in the Zidonian religion, they also believed that these great women that came down to the Jewish people were the matriarchs and they worshiped them as goddesses is what they were doing. And they had changed it into the host of heaven. And so the same thing was happening. It had just only changed goddesses. Now they made Diana their new god there in Ephesus. So it had kind of evolved to that point there in those particular times. So see, the point is, it's absurd to say that a woman is going to be saved by having kids. Totally absurd. Same thing for being that a woman has to be shamefaced. Well, she's got to be sad all the time. Let me tell you something. The women that were in the upper room that came out on the day of Pentecost were women that were on fire for God. And it wasn't just men on the day of Pentecost that got filled with the Holy Ghost. That's why I say, men, brethren, You've got to get off of your gender kick and you've got to get your mind into Christ because women are not subjugated to what you think. And you've got to get off this idea that translators are some kind of great gods that know how to translate a Bible right. They make mistakes. Or if they've made mistakes, they got an agenda, whatever the case may be. But there's a lot of major problems going on as a result. So anyway, Jezebel brings this in, and, and Ahab falls right into this here. Let me, let me share some things with you here that is actually written here about Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, uh, different pages here. Men of the clan are still regarded as sons of the matriarch. So therefore, they were doing this uh, through the genealogy there. As with advanced paternal kinship, men came to trace their ancestors, pay their worship to the patriarch, of the tribe and the flock they employed. So see, it's the same thing that the Catholic Church is doing the exact same thing today. They've made Mary their goddess. And of course, they've made the patriarch, Christ being the patriarch. In this case, they made Peter the patriarch. But they worship Mary. Another one, That's by the way, that's on page 719 if you want to look it up in that book there. And the settled life of the Chaldea uh, Ishtar has her 
uh, parallel and Ishara, a goddess, it would seem. By the way, the Chaldea, that's the Chaldeans, okay, or the Zidonians. But in this time frame here, it was uh, speaking about the Chaldeans. The Zidonians is the same, same uh, uh, people worship, worshiping the same thing. Because Eshtar is another word that was used. Eshtar was the first word. Ashtaroth was used later. And then we get into the New Testament. We have Diana, Artemis being the fertility gods. They're all fertility gods, by the way, all the way down. But in, in Chaldea, in the settled life of Chaldea, Eshtar has her parallel in Ishara, a goddess, it would seem, not of the flock, but of the soil. And another aspect, the goddess of war. See? So all these fertility gods, even in, all the way back then, were considered gods of not only fertility, but of war. No wonder why they believed in this violent sexual behavior because it was violent type behavior and it takes its roots all the way back to Chaldea from the goddess, all the way back to the goddess of Ishara who was the sister of Esther or parallels her and was a goddess of war and one of fertility. So they combine the two and they get their goddess Diana in the modern times there. Um, uh, another interesting thing that uh, just kind of, uh, let's see, I'd like to share with you here. This is, um, let's see here. Let me just read this here to you real quick. Uh, Artemis of the Ephesians was not a Greek divinity, but uh, Asiatic. This is shown by the fact that the eunuchs were employed in her worship, practice quite foreign to Greek I uh, ideas. She was not regarded as a virgin, but a mother, a foster mother, as it clearly is shown by the mul multitude of breasts in the root effigy. Uh, this is showing you what this goddess of uh, Artemis or Diana was. Undoubtedly a representative of the same power presiding over the conception of birth that was adored in Palestine under the name of Ashtaroth. Her worship, frantic and fanatical after the manner of Asia, was tracked back to the Amazons. Her temple at Ephesus was one of the wonders of the world, but its great glory was the image which fell down from heavens, according to Acts 19.35, uh, and this is in the New Unger's Bible Dictionary, just to show you that the link between Artemis uh, of the Ephesians, uh, Diana, and also to the, uh, to the Hebraic roots of it, as I was telling you, Ashtaroth. I just wanted to be able to share that with you as well. So now anyway, so we come in to modern days here, and we look at the Jezebel spirit of today. And this is something that I wanted to speak to you on as well, especially the, the brethren that, that listen. Uh, and I know there's a lot of godly brethren that are waking up and seeing these truths as well and, and appreciate it. And I so appreciate you, uh, especially Brother Robert there in, in the United States. I always see his comments on there. I'm sure you guys see it as well. He's such a wonderful brother there. Uh, God bless you, my brother. And uh, and. We appreciate your comments, appreciate all the comments that you guys do out there. But what I wanted to, to speak to you about is Jezebel. Today, as I've taught you in many other places from, from Jeremiah, Ezekiel, we see the types of Ahab and Jezebel playing out again today. God swore that he would not bring wrath upon Ahab, but he bring it upon his son. I shared those scriptures with you before uh, because he did repent. Now, Jezebel never repented, but he repented. And he said he would bring it upon his son. And I've really held to the fact that the son of Ahab in modern days is none other than Shimon Perez. And Shimon Perez has actually taken and he has married in Jezebel into Israel and brought idolatry back into Israel. And that is the Roman Vatican Church that has come into our people. And it has brought idolatry right back into Israel. Now, I want to share with you some scriptures about this because the Bible clearly says that... Um, in Revelation chapter 17, it talks about this great whore. 
And so I wanted to share with you some thoughts on this so you would understand. It says in 17.1, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked to me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And of course, the waters are multitudes of people. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have made, been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, you want to talk about a whore. The Catholic Church is a whore. Plain, as simple as you can get. And, you know, some people don't like that terminology, but it's all through your Bible. There it talks about the whore in, in the Bible continuously. And um, we see that what is a whore to begin with? It is a woman that has become untrue to her marriage vow. And the Vatican claims to be married to Christ but she's untrue to that marriage vow. Jezebel, she married Ahab, and Ahab brought idolatry into Israel because of Jezebel and her bringing in the gods of Baal and Ashtaroth into Israel, causing Israel, who was married unto God, to commit fornication and to commit adultery with God himself by going after other lovers, after other gods. It's the same thing the Catholic Church has done. You read the scripture where he says here, I will, uh, excuse me, um, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. The kings of the earth. What kings of the earth? Constantine was the first king that came along that she went to bed with. And she separated herself right there from God. And she slept with Constantine and brought forth a what she considered to be the Bible. Now, I'm not, the majority of the Bible is perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with it. The Hebrew Bible, the same way. We still got little issues here and there with translations. But the Catholic Church intentionally made sure there were some of the words that you would never get to see. Just like she also took and had her translators mistranslate things that clearly, even in the Old Testament, she did it because we can go back to the Septuagint and see that they, it was totally different from what the early scholars believed. So there has been an agenda. And the kings of the earth she committed fornication with. She committed fornication not just with Constantine, but with down through her history with other kings as well. And you can go and you can see they all go to bed with her, even in today, even in modern times. Now, the Catholic Church claims to be married to Christ, but yet she will kiss the Muslim, sleep and go to bed with them. She will go with the Hindus and serve their gods. She is doing the exact same thing that Jezebel did, and Jezebel served every god imaginable. And so does Rome. Rome does the same thing. And then the Bible goes on to say that the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. The wine represents her revelation. So therefore you're drunk believing her for, because of her fornication where she went and slept around with all these other religions and put a little bit of that religion in there, a little bit of that religion in there. And so the inhabitants of the earth, you're drunk with her own revelation. How do you, let me tell you something. I'll show you how that's a fact because the Muslim religion was created by the Vatican. And guess what? The Muslim religion happens to be nothing but Vatican inspired. Why do you think the women cover up there? They dress them like a bunch of nuns. You had uh, Kaji, who was a Roman Catholic girl that marries Muhammad, and they send Muhammad down to a bunch of monks in northern Africa and train him and have him write, have him go into all kinds of trances and seances and everything else in order to bring forth the, their, their Bible there. And of course, he never wrote nothing he couldn't write. His wife even said so and said he got so possessed of demons he couldn't even live with him anymore. And so the monks actually wrote what he was supposed to be, or what he supposedly saw. Isn't that kind of interesting to know? But if you'll notice, though, he made sure he didn't put Jesus down. He is considered a prophet. Why? Because the Catholic Church, they, they, they still, they, they want to claim their marriage to Christ. So even though they're committing spiritual fornication over here, they're going to make a whole race of people, all the, 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 the Arabs of the world, they're going to make them drunk with the wine of her fornication. Just like they take and they 
pervert the translations and they bring about the hatred and they also take and they chose who would be the early church fathers and they made sure that they agreed with whatever doctrine that they had written and then they brought them out. This is why there were certain canons that could never be brought in to be part of the scriptures because it disagreed with what they wanted to be taught. And then they had to take and they had to manipulate a little bit of Paul's work there. And they definitely didn't want you to see the letters that were written to Paul because then you might get what's going on. You know what? Let me just share some of those with you there so you'll understand. Because I dealt with this before, but I know there might be some ladies out here listening that would like to know this as well. Let's take right here 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14. Now, I showed you guys this in a video before, but I don't know if I'll get it up this time because it's a lengthy video. And I, I don't know if I'll remember to put it in there, but... Uh, in, the, in the Greek, in, in some of the ancient Greek writings that we still have, the verse 34 and 35 was actually set aside by the translator down at the bottom of the page in the, what we'd consider the margin there because they knew that it was a question being written to Paul and Paul was addressing it. But the Catholic Church made sure that got altered and they made sure that it got put right in there so you would think that Paul didn't like women and hated women. So the thing was here, let your women keep, in sil keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. There is no law in Judaism whatsoever that says that women are to be silent in the churches. I, I made the challenge before. You prove it. Now, I know y'all, somebody, that's where y'all come into the thing about Timothy there, so I knew I had to deal with that issue there to put that one right back down. I said the law. Believe me, Paul does not, uh, consider his words the law of God. But we did have what they called oral tradition. By the way, that's why we have Karite Jews. Karite Jews believe the word of God. We believe the Torah. We believe the Tanakh. We don't believe that the Talmud is the word of God because when you read the Talmud, we know that the writers there can't none of them agree with nobody on it, and yet that's supposed to be the oral law. And yes, in Talmudic tradition, women are to remain silent, but it's not God's word. So, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for the women to speak in the church. Yes, that is part of Talmudic tradition. Well, you're doing a good job then if you're teaching it. If you, you make great Talmudic Jews then, is all I can tell you. But notice though, Paul deals with it. He says, what came the word of God out from you or came it unto you only? See, Paul knows that that's not what God taught. God never taught that. It wasn't in the law. It was their tradition, and he's trying to show them that the word of God come from you only. He knew that the word came from Moses. It came from the prophets Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Zephaniah. None of them ever said these things. None of them. And it's not written in the law anywhere either, not in the five books of Moses, nowhere. So if it's not written there, you must think that the word of God come from you. That's what he's, that's what he's arguing. You think the word of God come from you only? No, it come from Moses is where it come from. And Moses didn't write it, so why do you try to write it? And Paul's dealing with this issue because even in the secular writings, Dr. Hutt, uh, I met Dr. Hutt, we had this conversation in Nebraska. And Dr. Hutt, clearly he says, I, I, I study, Steve, I'm a Greek scholar, I study the, the, these writings. And I know for a fact that they all thought that Paul was the most liberated man. There was the women, he, he liberated women like no other man of his time. And the people wrote about it. And they were in awe that he wrote it. So even Peter wasn't like that. Peter was still trying to still go according to the traditions of the Jews. Well, that's even written in other writings about Peter as well, that he was still, he still had that hothead temper. He still had issues there. He still wasn't 100% for women. In fact, the only apostle that was that way was Peter. So, anyway, but Peter does. He gave his life. As Jesus prophesied, the way you would not go, that way you will. So he did in the end. He gave his life for what he believed. So it's a hard road for Peter, very hard, no doubt. So he goes on to say here, but if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Y'all are pretty ignorant for claiming that to be part of the law is what he's saying there. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order, you know. Same thing with the headship doctrine. Oh, I love that. I've heard my wife always often say it's kind of cute. She said, I've never heard, I didn't know there was a head, a head to the ship. <laughs> anyway, the headship, the word uh, that we have here, so interesting here. Kephale. 
Hupata Samayi is where we start off with submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. That word submitting uh, yourself, Hupata Samayi, it's to yield yourselves one to another. Um, it's, in, it's in the middle voice and it, 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 is, it is totally uh, different than if you were to take, for example, uh, if, you, if you go to... Uh, uh, verse chapter 6, verse 1, children obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. This has nothing to do with submitting. It's not the same word. Hupatovako uh, is that word right there. And that word, by the way, is, is also, so it's similar to the Hupatosamayi, but the Tosamayi is in the middle voice in Koine Greek and carries a different meaning altogether. The children obeying your parents is a obedience verbiage there, whereas when you get into Samayi, submitting yourselves, it is a mutual yielding or a mutual submission one to another. Now in Greek, it doesn't say the next part in verse 22 that they have in here, wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands. No, it doesn't even say it, it says wives uh, unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. See, he's talking about mutual submission for the husband is the kephale of the wife. The word kephale is not head. You, now, you have to understand, head in one way would be right if you go back into the old Greek, uh, excuse me, the old English, maybe you would have it right because head would be the source or the origin of, which is what the Greek kephale actually is, the source of uh, this particular, uh, uh, you know, the words the husband is the source of the wife because why? God created Adam and from Adam he took Eve. He, Adam was that source because why? When God made them male and female, created he them. They were one unit, okay? And then he separated them and it became, so he's the source of that, all right? And, and even as Christ is the head or source, in other words, of the church and he is the savior of the body. See, so Christ, not the head, not the boss, not, it's like you can't say he's the boss because he said, uh, you know, Christ is the head. You don't say Christ is the boss of the, of the church. No, he says, I come to be your servant. What is he saying? I'm the source. What does it mean by source? In other words, he came with the tree of life inside of him. All the life that we were supposed to have had from Adam and Eve. But the tree of life was guarded back there in the beginning in Eden. It was guarded because sin had came in and God had to stop everything. When God breathed into that man called Adam that both man and woman were in that body, he says, Ipak pa'av nishmat chayim. That means he breathed into his nostrils the breath of God's own life in a plural form because why? There's two people there together. And when they came forth, Adam was not called Adam in the beginning. He's called Adam because he's made from the clay of the ground, but he was called Adam. He was called Ish before that because he was the fire of Almighty God. You know, he blew into his nostrils that breath of life. And then when he separated, when he brought Eve there, Eve is actually, you know, the Bible says she's bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Yes, that's the part of the natural side of the chemical uh, of the DNA. But he also says he brought her from Minish in Hebrew. Minish is from the fire of Yahweh, you might say. He brings Isha. And Isha and Isha is two Hebrew words. And the, one means, man, we translate it man and woman, but what is it? Is it? Both of them contain the word fire, ish, and they both contain the first two letters of God's divine name, the yod and the hey. Ish, alaf yod, shin, yod in the middle is in the divine nature there. And then uh, isha, alaf shin, hey, the second letter of God's divine name, concluding that he brings them out, separates them. They're both filled with the spirit of almighty God on the earth. And God gives them dominion over all the earth, over everything, over the animals, over the fish of the sea. They're given dominion. They're co-rulers, co-equal in the Garden of Eden. And Christ came to restore back that which was lost. And what was lost? They lost the right to the tree of life. And Christ is that tree of life. The Bible refers to him as an olive tree. So in the midst of the garden, there was two trees, the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. That life, the eighth chayim, 
And Christ being the olive tree, the olive branch, he's the one that gives that life. And he also gave the life to the church. Why? Because you are the wild olive branches grafted into him. And so therefore you're taking, partaking of the fruit and fatness thereof. So you're receiving from that life of Christ as well. And so therefore Christ breathes on you when he comes back from the resurrection. And he says, receive you the Holy Ghost. Showing that he was the same God that breathed in Adam's nostrils. Epoch ba'av nishmat in the beginning and gave them life okay so that's what was lost now to prove that point let's look and let's continue to read right there so if you don't take it as head or boss you take it as source christ is the source of the church in other words he's a source of life what did he say to the woman at the well i have you said he said give me a drink she says sir i'm a samaritan you're a jew we don't have anything to do with one another but he said if you knew it was asking you for the drink of water you'd ask me for a drink and i would give you water you don't have to come here anymore she says, sir, give me this water that I don't come here to drink anymore. And they're going back and forth and everything. She says, go get your husband. She says, I don't have no husband. She says, you had five and the one you live in is now is not yours. And she goes, oh my gosh, she says, that's what the Messiah would do when he comes. Is what you're saying right there. How does she know that that's what the Messiah would do? Because when Abraham had the three strangers that came up, the one that stayed with Abraham knew the secret of the heart. And he knew the secret of the heart. Wow. Think about that for a little bit. Why don't you? So she knew who he was. And he says, you know, he give you water flowing, springing up from the bellies, from your belly, from within. See, that's what you have need of is that water of life inside of you. And Christ was that source. That's why Moses smote the rock in the wilderness, showing that the Jews, what well, he says, get the elders of Israel, bring them out. They came out there with Moses, Aaron and his, and the elders of Israel, and he smote the rock that it would bring forth their water. They were complaining because they were thirsting to death. They were dying. Israel, when Christ came along, they're dying of thirst. They're dying spiritually. They don't have anything to drink. And the elders of Israel come together and they smite Christ. They judge him. And God takes and has his side pierced as Moses struck that rock and the water came forth. And when the Roman soldier pierced his side, the water and the blood came out showing that he was the very life of Almighty God. He was the, the light at the beginning of the creation. If you want to know anything about your end, look at the beginning. This is where it's at. It is that light. And the light was the light of men. Boy, I'm telling you guys a whole lot. I hope you're keeping up with me. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just on a toot right now. So anyway, so let's go down a little bit further. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his, uh, his wife loveth himself. Because why? We are the body of Christ. You're supposed to. Christ loves his body. Don't you think he does? What do you do? Why do you abuse her then? Why do you tell her to shut up? Why do you tell her she has no voice? She's got a lot of witnesses against you. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. Do you not get what he's saying of his bones? He's showing you that Eve came out of Adam. He's telling you right there, plain as day, Paul is showing you that the man was the source of the woman. He's talking about Adam and Eve. He says that we are the flesh of his bones. As God took Eve out of Adam, so he's taking us out of Christ. This is the great mystery that you're missing. For no man ever hateth his own flesh, but nourish and cherish it, even the Lord, the church. For we are the members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Adam said, you're of my, she is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Don't you get the second Adam here? For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall join to his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. You need to become one with Christ. Then you won't see women as women and you won't see men as men. You'll start seeing them as your brother, sister. You'll start seeing them as the body of Christ. You'll start seeing them as what they should be, the, the anointed of Almighty God with a voice to speak. And then he says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, not let not everyone of you in particular so love his wife even as his himself and the wife see that uh, that she reverence her husband you guys I don't see how you can miss this 
You know, you guys, you want to condemn these women. You call them Jezebel and everything. You know who the true Jezebel is? The true Jezebel that keeps that is drunk on the fornication of that great whore of Rome. You're drunk on her doctrine. Let me tell you something. I'll show you who some Jezebels are. Kenneth Copeland, he's a Jezebel. He's a whore. He's running back. Let me tell you something. The Vatican, Jezebel of today, Rome, she married, the Bible calls her a whore, and said, and the Bible said, or, or we, see, excuse me, we see that Shimon Perez, the son of Ahab, went and married her and has brought the idolatry into Israel. Now, she's a married woman, just like Jezebel was a married woman. Now, I'll give you something else that'll make your head spin a little bit and everything. When Jerome married the daughter of Ahab, that's Jezebel's daughter. But the funny thing is, is one place, it calls it Omri's daughter. So the question is, is whose daughter is it? Omri or is it uh, Ahab's daughter? Was Jezebel doing things back then too? Who knows? I think though really it has more to do like in the case of Jethro, who when he married uh, Zipporah, one was father, one was grandfather, but they referred to him both as father. So I don't think that's a big issue. But the point is, Jezebel definitely whored Israel around and made them commit spiritual fornication against God. That's where the truth of this is and today you've got ministers you've got steve uh whatever his name is there uh I'm sorry, uh, no, not Steve. His name is Osteen. I know that, uh, that that he's gone and committed whoredom with the Catholic Church. You've got Kenneth Copeland. You've got all kinds of different ministers that are committing spiritual whoredom. They're whoring around with the Vatican. And if you're taking Vatican doctrines, you're whoring around with the same Jezebel. You, know, you got to remember, she's married to Israel now but you're all going to commit spiritual fornication. Same thing with Israel today. The leaders in Israel today, because they went whoring around with the Vatican, they're committing spiritual fornication. The rabbis in Israel that are whoring around with the Vatican are committing spiritual fornication as well. So if you want to talk about whores and you want to talk about Jezebel and, oh, she's a Jezebel, no, there's more men that are Jezebels and that are sleeping with Jezebel by far. We got it all mixed up. Oh my gosh. I guess I should end. Chapter 17, verse 4 in the Revelation. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. You know, she's got a golden cup, all right. She does her communion services on a regular basis. And I don't know of anybody else decked in purple like she is. Hmm. Oh, my gosh. Brother, sister, I know I kept you guys probably too long. Um, God bless you. Remember us. It's the first day I actually had my voice back somewhat, and now I went to shouting and screaming, so I don't know if I'll have it again tomorrow, but I trust that for my sisters, this is a blessing for you. You, you sisters are free, completely free. I don't care what men come up with, what scripture they want to quote and everything. You have not, there was nothing but an agenda done against women. I can, Junia, they translated, translated the name in the 11th century, no less. Changed it to a male apostle when it was a female apostle in all the original Greek language everywhere. All the translations up into the 11th century, the Vatican changed that. They don't want you knowing the truth. So, like I said, the 12 apostles were men. Sure they were. After his death, burial, and resurrection, and the, and the spirit of life was restored back into the church. That's something I wanted to explain to you to know, though. When that spirit of life came back in the church, when God gave his life and he restored that breath of life, that's why the first person to bring the gospel message of the resurrection was a woman. It was Mary. Mary Magdalene, his beloved disciple. And you look at the story there of Mary and Martha. That's another one right there. 
I forget, I forget which, which way it was. I think it was Martha that was upset because Mary wasn't helping her in there doing the cooking and stuff. She says, I'm so caught up with all this burden trying to feed all these men and says, she's over here and won't leave your feet. Jesus said she chose the better, the better portion. Hmm. Think about that one for a while, right? God bless you. Pray for me. I'm give out now. <laughs> God bless you. We love you guys. Thank you, and thank you for remembering us and your support. Those of you that do support us, believe me, the more I keep preaching this, the more the more drop off. But it doesn't matter to me. I'd rather be true with God, tell the truth, than be found lying. Because on that day, I'll have to give an account. I don't want to be on the wrong side. God bless you.